I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church, located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday school lesson for July the 28th, 2019, is spiritual discernment. And another topic for this lesson is the pursuit of truth. And our Bible scriptures today are taken from the gospel according to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 1 through 6, and also verses 6, 15 through verse 23. And the background scriptures are the same. And we're still in this area of covenant in God, this, this quarterly theme. And then we have our unit of study that we're in right now, a heartfelt covenant. A covenant we found out to be an agreement between two or more. And it is uh, something that you have made a promise on. And this is agreement that we're going to keep. And when we make it a, a covenant with God, we find that he is the one that is most faithful in covenant keeping and keeping the covenant or his promises, his side of things. And while we've, we're in this right here, we're in the last part of the the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> we started out in the fifth chapter there with the Beatitudes that, and and Jesus goes up on, into the Mount and sits down and his disciples come to him as he departed from the multitude. I'm sure the multitude followed also, but his disciples came and he began to teach them saying, and he started with the Beatitudes, the attitude that a person should have when they are a believer, and uh, the person, uh, uh, something that they should strive toward as a believer. Then he goes on deeper and deeper into this Sermon on the Mount. He co goes into a lot of different li different things that 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 we should apply to our lives. But we are, we find that all of it. It will take the law that we knew of that Jesus came to fulfill to another degree. And we'll even find in that that it's even harder than it was when it was just the law itself. But Jesus made the statement that unless your righteousness or in my righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, we will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that put us in quite a predicament if we understood how the people at that time felt uh, what they felt about the scribes and the Pharisees, they knew that they were the religious leaders, the religious rulers, the scribes were the, the teachers, the, the ones that expounded on the law of God that, that were, knew the law better than anyone else because they were scribes. They wrote the law down. They knew it backwards and forward. And, and so they, they, uh, when, when Jesus made such a statement, it put people in that position where the Apostle Paul talked about, and we've said it in the last couple of weeks, there in Romans, the, the, the third chapter, when the Apostle Paul said, he wrote these things so that every mouth would be stopped and all would become guilty before God, that we'll all recognize the fact that we need a Savior, that we are just not keeping this as well as we might want to think that we are. One of the things that we find out as we go through and, and get especially into our lesson today, we find that how much we need the grace of God. Grace, that unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. We, we can't earn it. There's nothing that we can do that, that, that makes us good enough that, that God should just give us this. We can't earn it, we can't merit it, and we definitely don't deserve it because we have paid for the wages of sin is death, but thank God for that gift, that grace is a gift. It's nothing that you earn. If you earned it and you got paid with it, that was your pay, but you can earn this. We all deserve death. But because every mouth is stopped and all become guilty before God, we further add on to this truth about Jesus Christ as he takes as he takes us deeper and deeper into the the mind and heart of man. 
This lesson today actually takes us into something where many have tried to glaze over and fix and try to prop up. And, and, and mostly it's because of not understanding one of the words that begin the first, the first few, few words there, or the first word here in this seventh chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Judge, that word judge. So we begin this lesson. And, and this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount again. We, we, uh, we didn't go into the sixth chapter, but now we are moving in to this seventh chapter. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. Right there, right at the beginning, the Lord makes this statement. Now he would go on to explain what he's talking about when he makes this statement because what we're going to find out and what our writers want us to understand in, in this lesson today is that we do have to have spiritual discernment or either that, uh, that other topic we said, the pursuit of truth. Well, the only way to have both of those, the discernment, is to uh, examine fruit not be judges, but fruit inspectors to examine fruit. So in order to, to see when something is wrong, we have to ac actually listen to it and, and discern that and know that it is untrue because we have studied the word of God, because we've been exposed to the things of God. We know that that, that right there needs to be deleted from my mindset. But this first word tells us to judge not, that ye be not judged. Now, the word judge there, that let's, let's understand that word. That word in the Greek is krino. To, to judge means that you become the very person that makes all of the ruling on this. It means to try a person. You're actually putting them on trial in your own mind when you begin to judge them. When you look at them, you don't understand why they're doing the things they do, they're doing. You don't understand what they have gone through to get to this point in their life where they have made this decision. You don't know what drove them to this point. But you have decided within your own mind to put them on trial in your own mind. And, and, and also, the next thing, the, the big part of the word crino means to condemn. You have decided to condemn them. And with your condemnation of them, with your taking them down, you decided what punishment should happen to them. And the very punishment you want to happen them, to them came in the word condemn. You want them to be cast out. You want uh, an, an avenging to happen upon them. You have drawn a conclusion. That's all. These are all the, 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 the things that, that, that Crino means. You have, you have damned them. You have made and caused a decree to happen in your mind. You have decreed something upon them. You have made your own determination about them. And you have judged them and sentenced them already. The word crino means to judge them to, to condemnation. You have taken this person down and cast them out, condemned them, something you don't even have a right to do. But Paul said, judge not. Then there was a comma. And then, I mean, Jesus said, rather, I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus said, judge not. He said that ye be not judged, that you won't be judged, so that you won't be judged. So if if, if you're judging them, and, and you might be judged also, so you don't judge them because everyone, when they look at their own situation, they're always going to see it different than someone else's. We feel like we deserve the grace of God on our situation, but do we actually have grace for everyone else? Do we ever show mercy toward anyone else? We, we always want the good for ourselves, but do we ever give the good? Do we ever show the good, good things? But we do have to make determinations sometimes. We do have to discern. 
So this is not saying that you don't inspect the fruit, and we'll get deeper into that in just a second, but it, it, it is a thing of where we have to have, we have to judge to identify and for restoration, for identification and for restoration, that is why we see things, not to condemn them, not to destroy them, not to cause a sentence to come upon them, not to make our own conclusion about them. So verse two says that Jesus is still talking. He says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Okay. You have made this decision about that person. You have condemned them. You have, 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 have pronounced condemnation on them. You have made your own decree about them. Jesus said, back up. Let's look at this again. He says, for with what judgment you judge, you use this right here. And I like to use it because I was in the construction world or still kind of in it. I use a tape measure quite often. So what he's saying here in essence is whatever you use to measure them by, Whatever the tape measure you use to a yardstick to, to measure them by, be careful because they may use the same thing to measure you. He said, for what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Well, if you judge them to condemnation by using these methods and these tactics, the same things that you use to judge them with, because nobody deserves the grace of God. There are things in your life that are wrong just like there are in other people's lives. And, and those things, if you don't forgive them, if you can't get past that and find grace for that person, find mercy for that person, you and you judge them in this type of way to condemn them and make your own ruling about them, then these same things can come back on you. They can come back to you. And, and that's what he says here. And ye, sh ye shall be judged. And with the same measure, it be met, uh, ye meet that you put on them, it shall be measured to you again. That same thing that you use to condemn them with, that same thing that you use to make the decision on them, it'll be brought back and the decision will be made upon you. Verse three says, in other words, Jesus is saying with verse 3, let me, let me further explain. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But consider not the beam that is in thy own eye. So Jesus further breaks this down. He says, uh, he says okay, well, let's, 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 let's look at this in, a, in another way. So you are here in this position where you are Judge, ju judge, jury, and the executioner, you, you're going to make all the decisions. You're going to sentence this person. You're going to draw the conclusion. You're going to damn them to be sent to hell. It, it, you're sitting in this position. But let's look at you, is what Jesus is saying here. Well, you're thinking that you're sitting pretty good. You're, look, you're looking at that person to even judge yourself by thinking that you're looking pretty good sitting where you're sitting. And what he says here, you, you're, you're sitting here looking at that person with this moat in their eye. Moat. Now, ultimately, a piece of sawdust is, is what a moat is. It's, it's carfus in, in the Greek, which, which means a, a dry twig or straw, but something very little that, that is minute at, at according or compared to what is really in your eye. He said, you're looking at this little twig or this, this, this sawdust in, in, in this guy's eye, in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the fact that you got a uh, dacos in your own eye, a beam that are a, a piece of a two by four in your own eye, you're not seeing that. You're, you're looking at, 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 at them, seeing them in a worse light than yourself, and actually you're sitting in a worse light than them. 
And, and Jesus is speaking very much to the heart of things. When we start to condemn people, start to look down on them, when we start to judge them in, in this type of way, to, to be the judge, jury, and executioner, when we start want, wanting to put ourselves in that position right there, he's actually telling us that you have the bigger problem than that person right there that you saw as having a problem. You have a bigger problem if you're judging them to condemn them. If you can't can't look at them and love them and without judging them to condemn them and not looking at them, seeing if you can help them in some, some type of way, it, it, then you're, you're not trying to re restore them, then you have a beam in your eye. You have a log in your eye, and you're looking at the sawdust in their eye. So Jesus wanted to help you with this. He said, or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the moat or the sawdust out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. He said, you, you look at him and you say, well, whoa, wait, wait a minute, let me, let me get that out of your eye. And while you're trying to get that out, you have something in your eye that is is twice as uh, way bigger, not not twice as big. That is mega, and and that's sticking out of your own eye. You you're looking at things from the wrong perspective because you're looking at that person to condemn that person. So it's saying Jesus is saying that you are in the worst light. That's what he's talking about here in this. So he goes on to just say that plainly in the fifth verse. He says, thou actor, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of their, thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. He's not saying that you can't help your brother. We, you with your spiritual, restore such a one, the apostle Paul said, in the spirit of meekness, lest ye find yourself in the same thing. So if you, you, you need to, to, to restore that person, you, but you can't restore that person because you're looking at them in a way of condemning them. You have drawn a conclusion upon their life. You're trying them by your own methods, but you're, you won't try yourself by the same things. And he said that you, you're an actor. You're, you're, you're a hypocrite is what he says here in that. He said, first of all, First of all, Jesus said in verse five, it, first, this is the first thing you need to do. You need to take care of your own situation. In other words, go home and make sure your own house is clean before you start trying to clean mine up. It's what he's saying here at, at this time. Make sure you get, you got your own things, your, your own ducks in a row or your own stuff in order before you try to come and help me get mine in order. It, it, He's not saying that you shouldn't help, but what he's saying that how are you going to help when your situation is bigger and your situation is bigger if you're judging that other person to condemn them. He, he says that then thou shall see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. When you have resolved your own situation, when you have got that malice out of your heart, that trying them to condemn them, when you have, have stopped putting them in a position where you have already sentenced them and say they wasn't, they're not worth anything and their granddaddy wasn't either, when you get to the position where you start saying things like that and, 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 and try to say bad things about them, what should happen to them, uh, and because you feel like they've done something wrong, then you'll put yourself in a bad position. Now, the Lord didn't tell you that, that there are situations where you have to discern. You may have to make a determination. The Apostle Paul said in the 16th chapter of Romans, uh, verse 17, he said, now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. The, in order for you to mark them, you have to make a determination on them, but you didn't mark them to condemn them. There are things that you can do that you don't even, don't even have to be around them to do it. 
You can pray for a person that is mistreating you, that you see mistreating others. If you can't do anything good for them, if you can't say anything good about them, sometimes maybe you ought to just stay away from them and, and pray for them because prayer does work and it does work from over here. It works over there. And the other thing he says here in verse six, he says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, this one might be a little bit difficult to understand. He says, don't give that which is holy. Uh, you, have, you want to share the word of God, but you are seeing that every time you share the word of God with them, the, the, in, in the Old Testament, there were two animals that were considered unclean. And the two, two of the animals are mentioned here, the, the, the dog and the swine. They were considered unclean animals. So he said, don't give that which is holy to that which is unclean or that which won't accept it. That will co continue to trample. Every time you say something, they have something to try to come back at you at because they don't want to receive the word of God the way that the Lord has given it. They, they don't want to accept the word of God. Let the word of God do its job. If, if they don't want to accept it, get away from it because, because they'll begin to trample the word of God under their feet or, or they'll walk upon the word of God, try to tear it down. Then they'll come at you after they've done that. And then our lesson, instead of dealing with all the things in, in, in between there, talking about the, 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 the wide and the narrow gates, and we get down here to where we talk about the false prophets, where we were trying to get to, to in the first place, the spiritual discernment. That because even though we we're, not, we're told not to judge, to condemn, crino, we are told to inspect the fruit. So he says here, the verse 15, he says, beware of false prophet. Beware. If you went to someone's house and they had a sign on the gate, say, beware of dog. Well, it would give you pause before you went inside of that gate, because inside of that gate, chances are they have something that will, that can rip you apart. And that's exactly what the Lord is talking about here as he says, beware of false prophets because they can rip you apart. As a matter of fact, he'll go on to say that. He says here, which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Wolves. Now, they come to you in sheep clothing. They look good to you. They're, they're, they, they have a smooth tongue, but inwardly they are raving wolves. In other words, they're about to tear you apart. They're about to rip you apart. They have a set and uh, agenda. They're, they're, going, they're trying to do something to you. Well, the, the John would say this in, in a little bit different way. They're in 1 John, the, the fourth chapter, verses, verses 1. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There are false prophets. And let me tell you, just like you open the gate and there's a Doberman inside of that gate, you these false prophets, they are bad dogs. They, they can hurt you in, 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 a, in a bad way. Well, one of the ways that they, they hurt you is that they, they are covetous. And, and this is one of the big things of, of our day, our day and time. But Peter told us that these times were going to happen along with the Apostle Paul in the 20th chapter of the Acts of the Apostle. He said, but Peter says here in 2 Peter, the second chapter, verse 3, And through covetousness shall they make fame words, make merchandise of you, with fame words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingered not, and their damnation slumber if not. They, they, they use these words and they make merchandise of you. They start to, to build up their own personality, build themselves up. And, and, and uh, Apostle Paul said that, that they'll begin to preach about themselves or build up and lift up themselves all in order to make themselves rich or make themselves look better than anyone else. 
So these are the the acts of the of the the false prophets. But here he says in the 16th verse, "Ye shall know them." Here's the way you know them. We just told you about them. We just read what John said about them that you're to try the spirits by the by the by and and know that see if they are of God. We just told you Peter said that they're covetous and they want to make merchandise of you. We just told you the Apostle Paul said that they will begin to preach and lift up themselves. They won't want you to even listen to you, listen to themselves above God. They shall you shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Uh, uh, do they? Shall you you'll know them? How? You'll inspect the fruit. You look at the fruit. And they'll be tested by the doctrine of Scripture. When they begin to speak the Word of God, or what they say are telling you is the Word of God, you should be able to check it by the Word of God. The Word of God is not changing because people don't like it. God said, He let us know that in the Word of God that He does not change. He doesn't change. We have to change. There is something has to change in us. Matter of fact, the word re repent means to change your mind. We have to change our mind about who we think Jesus is in order for us to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But God is not changing just because we don't we don't like something he said in this area. And somebody go out there and tell you he's doing something new now. He's not doing that anymore. And yes, he is. He's still God. And he's doing the same thing. Jeremiah said, search for the old paths. The reason he said, search for the old paths is because if it was good for Paul and Silas, it's good enough for me. So he's telling us here that men don't gather grapes from the thorns. That's, that's not where you're going to find the, the grapes. You're not going to find the, the figs in, in the thistles are also thorns. It's uh, uh, kind of in the same terminology there. But verse 17 says, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. If it's a good tree, the fruit that come off that tree is going to be good. It's, it's Jesus is putting this all together, trying to help us to understand something. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. If that tree is corrupt, the fruit that is going to come off of it is going to be evil. Even though the words might sound real good. Might, might even tickle your fancy, might tell you that you got a check coming in the mail tomorrow and you begin to shout and pass out. And, but let me tell you something about the passing out. I saw people passing out at a Michael Jackson concert, and I ain't got nothing against Mike, but but Mike wasn't speaking spiritual things that day. And so so be 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 careful when you start getting into those mindsets and, and things like that. So here, here he says that that corrupt tree, it, it, it's going to bring forth evil fruit. And verse 18 says, a good tree cannot bring forth, uh, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. The good tree can't do that. That's not what it is it's designed to do. Neither can a corrupt tree bring it forth good fruit. That And he's just saying the same things. They're just kind of breaking it down, bringing it back to us, saying the same thing over and over again. The good tree is going to bring forth good fruit. If that tree is a tree, if that person is a person that really loves people, that, that is really a disciple of Jesus Christ, he said, you'll know my disciples by the love that they have for one another. They may be mean on one end and, 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 and can't stand you on the other, but see you hungry and go buy you a bag of groceries, still mean and mad, but still love because they are good on the inside. The Lord has changed them and they are one of his disciples and love is going to flow from them even when they're mean. That's the way that, that, that a believer is. But a corrupt person, they'll want to condemn you. They'll want to tear you down. There won't be any love. They'll always have hateful words for you uh, about anything. And that, that is Jesus just bringing all of it home. Then verse 19 says, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is the ultimate Open the ultimate decision that the Lord makes about that which is is corrupt, that corrupt tree, that that tree that doesn't bring forth any good fruit or bring forth good fruit. It's cut down. It is it's 
Why does it come off the ground? Why is it sitting there if it's not going to help out in any type of way? Wherefore, by their fruit shall ye know them. He's saying that again, that, that same thing that, that he said in the verse 16. He says, you'll know them by their fruit. You don't have to judge them to condemn them. The Lord does the ultimate judging. You can pray for them. You'll know them, though, by their fruit. You'll have spiritual discernment. There'll be things that you will un understand about them. You'll hear their message and you'll know. And the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1 and 8, he said, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, ye have, which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Even if we, uh, the, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about himself. If I come to you and start trying to preach something other than Jesus Christ and him crucified, then I need to be accursed is what he was saying there. So, so we'll know them by their fruit, by the message that they have flowing from their lips. They'll be tested by the doctrine of scripture, the word of God. Jesus is the living word. They'll, you'll be tested by Jesus himself. Verse 21 says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Not everyone that says to him, Lord, Lord, there'll be some that will try to try to even smooth you over. Those false prophets, they will say, Lord, Lord. Now understand that that John did did talk about there in that first chapter uh, uh, in the fourth chapter of First John he did talk about the fact that 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 you'll know them about by the things that that they're saying, but also you'll be the, able to determine uh, that they are false prophets because they'll deny that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. There'll be other things that, that will help you to discern things about them, but notice that everything that you, that you and I use to discern about that person is written down in the scripture. So it, it is imperative that we understand what the word of God teaches. So he says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But those that do the will of my father, what is the will of his father? What is it that we must do? It, it, it's, if Jesus Christ has done all the work, what is it? Well, Jesus did tell them there in John, the sixth chapter, 29th verse, said, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he has sent. You believe on Jesus Christ. That's the will of God. It's hard for you to believe on him if you got your have set and made your own agenda. Verse 22 says, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, have we not prophesied in thy name? It, it, and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. Maybe you have, but maybe you Maybe you haven't. Maybe this is just a lie. Or, or maybe you're doing this by the power. The devil is, is, is doing this so that he can continues to be the type person he is, a deceiver. Remember, some of Pharaoh's uh, prophets were able to do some of the same things that, that, uh, that Moses was doing. The, the same miracles that Moses was doing so that the demonic spirits can do some things. Maybe you did do them, but it wasn't the power of the Lord himself. It was always the thing of, de the, of the devil that was trying to work his own agenda at that time. And then verse 23 says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 13, if a person was a prophet, was a prophet and he prophesied something that didn't come to pass, then he was to be put to death. But Jesus is saying here that this, this person will have to depart from him because they work iniquity. What is the iniquity that they're working? They never accepted him as Lord and Savior so that they could be cleansed from the inside out, so that they could be converted. So in our pursuit of the truth, let's have a mind that is discerning. Let's have a spiritual discernment as we draw closer to Jesus Christ, as we learn more and more about the word of God 
but let's not be people that condemn another person to place a person in our own judgment to sentence them under our own minds and, and, and hearts. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we pray that this word will simmer on our hearts and minds all the day long. Help us to be people, Lord, that are not judging people to condemn them, but always looking at them to try to restore them in some type of way, Lord, when we see them out of order or out of line. Lord, help us to be fruit inspectors and minds of, de of discernment. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.